Good afternoon and good evening. And depending on where you are joining this, uh, the fifth edition of IFCN Talks. Um, my name is Baibars Ursik. I'm the director of the International Fact Check Network. And I'm so happy that we have Kathleen Hale Jameson today, um, the, the founder of, um, she's a professor at, of communication at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, she's the director of its Annenberg Public Policy Center, which also hosts uh, factcheck.org. And she's also a co-founder of factcheck.org. And we are so happy to have you here with us today, Kathleen. Um, so we will have an interesting conversation today. And you are strongly encouraged to participate by asking questions using the Q&A function, uh, chat with other participants and panelists, just make sure that you use the function accordingly. So if you wanna you know, uh, let other panelists, let other participants see your messages, just choose all participants in the chat. Uh, but if you just want Captain and I to see your you know, uh, messages, please make sure that you also use the function accordingly. Um, you can also um, rest assured that you will be provided with a live recording of the session later today. Uh, so this um, session is being recorded, as you can see on the top left part of the screen. Um, so really happy that we are doing this today. And I would like to start by welcoming Caitlin. Um, Caitlin, thank you so much for uh, doing this today with us. It's a pleasure to be with you. And let me introduce Gary Gaiman, who's the, the person who makes PowerPoints possible for me. And if he'll take the screen, I'll, I'll begin. What I, I'd like to talk with you today is about the possibility that uh, we've conventionalized a sequential or chronological structure for some of our fact checking that in, when dealing with infectious diseases might be better organized topically. And that secondly, in the categories that we're dealing with in infectious diseases, there are ways to proactively incorporate public health knowledge into fact checking in a way that will arm our audiences better when they are confronting unanticipated deceptions that we haven't yet fact checked. So that's basically the thesis I'm going to argue today. And we'll be releasing today a survey of the US public uh, that suggests that there is a real need for the kind of work that we do, but also that there's been real success for the public health community and the fact checking community. When you ask the question, vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines are effective in pre preventing COVID-19, you want to know is it true or false? Most people in the United States, three out of four get that right. Is it safer to get the COVID-19 vaccine than to get COVID? Most of that, most get that right as well. That means we've got three out of four people who are already armed with the good knowledge about vaccination and about COVID. And if you think knowledge shapes decision-making, then that's very good news for the US public. So what is our fact-checking doing in this domain? Well, we have 12% and 10% that are getting the answer wrong, but 14 and 15% who are unsure. The likelihood that our fact-checking will influence those who have already decided that they know the answer and their answer is wrong is not very great. Most of the literature says that, including a meta-analysis that I did with my colleagues. But those 14 and 15% who aren't yet sure are more likely to be susceptible to persuasion about what the facts are in a given circumstance. And so when we ask the question, are we able to actually make a difference? Sometimes our capacity to make a difference is greater or lesser, depending on how many people are already locked in. Now, part of the reason that's important and here's a broader profile from this survey that we're also releasing today along with those top line results. And you'll have a copy sent to you at the end of the day, the entire survey, along with the piece we have coming out today in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, what we see here is that you've got a lot of people who already have the right answers to most questions. It's those who are unsure, who are potentially most susceptible to a fact checking piece by, by one of the people in the journalistic community. And what that means is that if we can arm those who are already getting the answer right with the best available knowledge, they can also, in essence, become part of our community by engaging in proactive communication about the deceptions that are circulating in that community. So our goal is not simply making sure that we increase the numbers of people who have the answers to consequential questions answered in a fashion that's consistent with the best public health science but also that those who are already knowledgeable have what they need in exchanges with their families and friends to talk with them about why we believe that the scientific community knows that this is the best available answer right now. So there is a need, even when you have high levels of public knowledge to continue in our important enterprise. And in particular, to arm those who are already knowledgeable with a broader repertoire of information 
to make it easier for them to engage constructively and to help those who are unsure determine what is the best available knowledge that science has on a topic, recognizing that that knowledge will be continuously updated as new knowledge emerges. So we've all looked at these kinds of claims that are circulating. We've all fact checked them. What happens when we're fact checking them? We ask into what categories do we put them? But before doing that, let's take a look at the system we're involved in. I think of this as a science defense system. So you see those deceptions floating around over or misinformation, misconceptions over on the left side of the screen. I'm calling them viral deceptions. I don't like the term fake news. News can't be fake. If news is legitimate, it self-corrects. And so fake news is an oxymoron. What are we really worried about, particularly online, is viral deception. Deception is our concern, and its virality is a particular problem. So in this science defense system model, there's all that viral deception sitting off on the left, and the platforms can block it or downgrade it. The fact checkers come in and correct it, and their work can also be part of the process of reaching those people who are searching for deceptions if the platforms are posting it up in a fashion that's accessible to those individuals. So we fall as fact checkers into this first block, and that's where factcheck.org and its side check project exist. But we also have a second layer of protections. These are knowledgeable people, including those who've read our fact checks, and also professionals who are engaged in a new area called infodemiology, which is being developed by our partners, among others, in New York, the Critica Science individuals. These are doctors and people with medical background. We're going online in order to engage in conversations with individuals about misinformed beliefs about public health or about questions that they have about what is and is not accurate. So if the platforms haven't blocked it or downgraded it, if the fact checkers haven't caught it, if those knowledgeable individuals haven't found a way to engage it in a way that blocks it effectively for individuals who come over to the, the more accurate side of a question, uh, the last protection is individuals and families within their communities. We always thought about our audience as being the press and then the public, but our audience is also every individual in the public who, if that information circulates in their environment, needs to be armed to better address it. And that's particularly important when we're dealing with topics of, that relate to behavior, such as vaccination. So this is the basic model that I'm working within, and the fact checkers are right in the middle of that protective shield process. So next slide. How did we get here? Let me start with a bit of history. So the fact check fact checking process in the United States focused intensely and solely on politics was developed by factcheck.org's model not to talk to the public at all. As this piece in the Washington Post in 2004 noted, factcheck.org is providing a resource for media outlets without the staff or energy to do this level of solid analysis. We weren't in the United States in factcheck.org trying to reach the public. We thought that we were seeing a lot of journalists on deadline who had to get posting up their material quickly, had to write quickly, who wouldn't adjudicate a he said, he said. And yes, most of the time in 2004, those were mail to mail exchanges. They, were, they didn't have time. And so they would, they would simply say he said, and then he contradicted, he said. We thought the journalists, if they had the time, would be adjudicating that and would tell us what we could reasonably know in that moment about that controversy. So we saw factcheck.org, which I co-founded with Brooks Jackson, formerly of CNN, formerly of Wall Street Journal, formerly of Associated Press, and an amazing journalist. We thought we would be able to anticipate the likely areas in which there would be encounters in which facticity was at issue. And we'd be able to have our journalistic capacity in play to find out what was the best available evidence, provide the links, because now people were increasingly online. And so we could do this online. We were an online platform then as we are now. And journalists could simply use us. They would get an exchange. They could check to see had we checked it. If we had, we'd have the links. We'd have the write-up. And they could, if they thought it was credible and found it plausible, simply incorporate. We thought we'd solve the he said, he said problem, in other words, by providing a kind of backstop for our journalistic colleagues. So one question was, could we anticipate the deceptions? And could we, as a result, get as many of them as possible available, fact-checked well for that kind of use? That's what we were doing until this moment in 2004. Cornered, Cheney pounced. 
The uh, reason they keep mentioning Halliburton is because they're trying to throw up a smoke screen. They know the charges are false. Um, they know that uh, if you go, for example, to factcheck.com, an independent uh, website uh, sponsored by the University of Pennsylvania, you can get the specific details with respect to uh, Halliburton. Actually, funny story. Uh, if you go to factcheck.com, you'll be rerouted and learn that George Bush is endangering our safety and must not be reelected in a message from billionaire investor George Soros. So, there's actually a slight factual error. Cheney actually had a factual error on his fact check reference. <laughs> what Cheney meant to say was factcheck.org, which is a nonpartisan clearinghouse of politician statements, which leads today with an item about, yes, how Cheney got their web address wrong. <laughs> So we were just checking along, getting journalists picking up our material, and then Dick Cheney made us accessible to the public. And this was the middle of the night. I got a call from the staff. I put my personal credit card down to buy extra server capacity because suddenly we were reaching the public instead of reaching the press. We hadn't intended to do that. We were designed for that function, provide the press with some backup capacity. So Dick Cheney changed our model. Next slide. And what we saw was that, this is from the New York Times in 2007, the public responded. At its peak during 2004, factcheck.org drew up to 400,000 unique visitors a day, a strong indication of the public's appetite for help in sorting through the claims of candidates. <laughs> we moved, in other words, to being a public service, as are all of you now, and the fact-checking model now largely is one that has the public as well as journalists as its audience. Next slide. Now in the process, we conventionalized a structure that was chronological. As we wrote, we posted. And so you see here, the most recent thing we did is on top. We thought journalists would look, they'd find it, they would grab it, they'd use it. Remember, we said our motto was steal our stuff. The sequential chronological process made some sense in that environment. Next slide. But it makes more sense when you're dealing with, for example, an infectious disease, to use a thematic structure, not a sequential structure. Let's look at the difference. So this is what a chronological structure looks like. This is our factcheck.org chronological structure. We're just posting things as we write them. We write about politics, we write about COVID, we write about science. Now notice, you have to go through the political stuff to find the COVID, and if COVID is organized by when we filed it in this structure. Next slide. Other sites are doing the same thing. Here's PolitiFact. They're posting that long, they're posting based on, and then sometimes moving those things that have more traffic and more interest toward the top of their file. But in the process, they're not organizing thematically by topic. Next slide. Washington Post, however, did something innovative in many things innovative, but here's something in the, in the fall of 2020, uh, they piloted a categorical structure. They grouped like questions and answers. They used icons to indicate categories. And then they bubbled up frequency and popularity. And it looked like this. Now they discontinued November 6th, but we're crediting them with doing something that we thought was very important. Notice the icons could, could drive you to what you're interested in the topic. And you could then in theory, organize those icons in a structure that would create an understanding of how infectious disease works and how scientists answer questions about it. But what the Washington Post is doing here is putting up icons in the order that makes sense to them, how it spreads vaccines and treatments, mortality rates. There's a logic underlying this that potentially begins to teach people some things about how these things relate to each other. But what state and federal response doing in there? What about flu and cold season or Trump's response to coronavirus? If we wanted a coherent understanding of what we know about infectious disease, COVID specifically, and then we want to see the answers to the questions the public is asking about facticity in that context, you still would have to do a lot of searching in the icons because there's not an organizational structure, what scholars would call a schema of understanding of infectious diseases under those icons. But it certainly is a different way of approaching and a real innovation. So thank you, Washington Post. What would, what would thematic categories look like if you approached infectious diseases through them? Here's what a thematic COVID, COVID structure might look like. But before saying that, here's the reason I'm recommending it. We know from the scholarship about memory 
Next slide, that organizing content by categories increases recall. We don't want people to just read our stuff or watch our stuff. We want them to remember our stuff. And we want them confronted with a new circumstance in which the topic area is at issue. Hence, a lot of potential deceptions related to it are at issue to call that knowledge back. And if we want them to do that, a topical structure makes sense. So can we create a topical structure about infectious disease that will provide the organizational framework through which we disseminate our knowledge and into which we organize our relevant fact checking, at least about infectious diseases in general, COVID in specific? We believe the answer is yes, that you can parse into origins, existence and virulence, transmission, diagnosis, testing, and tracing, prevention, preventatives, and treatment, and vaccination. And those are basic public health categories. And in each of those categories, you could have distortions of science, bottom of the screen, or you could have conspiracy theories about them. Those are actually separable. And sometimes you have conspiracy theories that distort the science about them but the core of the public health knowledge is going to fall into those top categories. Now, do the categories work to organize? Let's ask the question, next slide. Here are our claims, next slide. Here are our categories, claim. The virus was bioengineered, origins, claim. Asymptomatic people cannot give others the virus, transmission, claim. COVID is a hoax, existence and virulence, claim. Testing creates more cases, diagnosis, testing and training <laughs> and tracing, claim. Masks don't work, prevention, claim. Hydroxychloroquine cures COVID, claim. VAERS data show COVID-19 vaccines have killed thousands, vaccination. So I can show you that at least some of the prevalent claims that are problematic because they potentially affect behavior do parse into the category system. Next slide. Our coders can also place a hundred other claims reliably into those categories. Thank you, coders. Next slide. And that means that we can organize at least our FAQs or for factcheck.org, our ask side checks into these categories, which means that we can move what we have as the basic knowledge, the core answers into those categories of understanding. And if we can, we're beginning to put in place what I call proactive, preemptive, protective knowledge. And the theory is this, if we find a way to reinforce this, to express it clearly, when someone confronts a new deception, one we haven't checked, they will be better armed with it. And we can use this in order to contextualize the deceptions that fall into those categories. If people know it, we can then reprise it on the back end to debunk. But it is more effective to have knowledge in place before people are exposed to deception than to debunk after they've been exposed and accepted it. We found that in a meta-analysis that we did with my colleagues when the bottom finding was don't negate, displace. Put in place a carefully detailed understanding of what is rather than just telling people, no, that's wrong. Well, if that works to correct on the back end, then we ought to be able to take that displacive content, that accurate knowledge, that foundational public health knowledge and move it to the front end in our fact checking process. And that's what I mean by integrating protective health knowledge into infectious disease or COVID categories. Next slide. So let's take a look at the thematic categories and see how they work. Here's prevention. Prevention, these are all categories that we recognize. We've all checked within these categories. Next slide. Masking is one of those categories. Next slide. Masking can be broken up into its own subcategories. We can parse most of the big deceptions about masking into these three categories or distortions of science and conspiracy theories about these categories. The first is just, there's no evidence that masks work. The second is masks have been studied and have been shown to be ineffective. And often the assumption underlying that claim is if it isn't 100% effective, it doesn't work at all. I just put that in parenthetically. And third, mask wearing increases risks to health. So imagine that we took those three blocks of deceptions 
and we move them into these three categories. And imagine there were a rebuttal structure for each of those categories that was different, but that your foundational knowledge that you would want in place, regardless of the refutational structure you're using or the evidence you're using, is that here is the evidence that masks work and here is how and why. I'm arguing that in every one of the fact checks on any of those three categories, in addition to the specific rebuttal, we would be putting that information into our fact checks. And that it ought to be at the beginning of the fact check, the exposure ought to be there and then interwoven and deepened throughout because we're trying to increase the likelihood that people will understand no matter what the deception about masking, this is what the research has shown and this is why we believe it is true that masks help reduce the spread. Next slide. Each category, as I've mentioned, can also be talked about in terms of distortions of science and conspiracy theories. So in the core, we have health beliefs that are being questioned in some way. On each side, we have potential distortions of the science and conspiracy theories. Next slide. So let's take another look. Here's vaccination. We believe you can parse the vaccination claims as we could the masking claims. Next slide into these categories, importance, nature, and value, safety, ingredients, efficacy, effectiveness, and immunity. Next slide. Now let's take a look at how we would do that. Claim, VAERS has documented thousands of deaths from vaccines, safety. Vaccines contain microchips to be used for surveillance. Now pause for a moment. For surveillance, ah, that's a conspiracy theory, but vaccines contain microchips, that's just about ingredients. This illustrates how you can conspiracize a claim and how you would actually be in both areas in our taxonomy if you offered that claim. VAERS has documented thousands of deaths. That's a distortion of science as well as a claim about safety. So what I'm trying to show is the top and bottom categories, distortion of science and conspiracizing, conspiracy theories, can be applied to the internal categories on many claims. Next claim, natural immunity is preferable to vaccinated immunity, goes to immunity. Next claim, vaccines cause sterility and fertility, goes to safety. Next claim, clinical trials overstated efficacy, goes to efficacy and effect effectiveness. The vaccine may not work. Claim goes to efficacy effectiveness. Next claim, only viruses made in labs require vaccines, goes to importance, nature, and value of vaccination. So what you can see is we think that you can parse not simply into the big categories, origins, transmission, prevention, treatment, vaccination, but into subcategories within them. But as you're doing that, the backdrop on vaccination is still, how does vaccination work? How do we know vaccination works? How do we know that these vaccines have been adequately tested? How do we know that the tests have found that they are effective? And how do we know that they've found that they are safe? And I'm going to in a moment say there's some language here that's important because we shouldn't be saying safe but safer than because there will always be exceptions. Nothing is going to be categorically 100% safe under all circumstances. And effective but not 100% effective in all circumstances. And as a result, the language in which we communicate the core knowledge is really important because if we don't communicate with care, our communication of that knowledge can actually seed deceptions. Someone hears they're safe and they hear categorically under all circumstance and there is a side effect. And they're going to say, ha, you lied. So making sure that we have nuanced the claims that we are offering becomes very important. But the larger point is this thematic structure gives you the ability to deploy core knowledge on a regular basis that is potentially preventative, proactive, preventative, protective, core knowledge. Here's what this looks like then when we take examples of misinformation, we align them back to the vaccine categories inside the public health box, and we put our fact checks up to the right of the screen. We actually are all doing this. The question is, how do we group it and how do we think of those groupings in ways of communicating common knowledge across categories? Next slide. Now you see my distortions and conspiracy theories on each side. That's simply for illustrative purposes. Here are some of the examples of distortions of scientific findings and conspiracy theories. We've all checked these. Next slide. Same, same illustration on vaccinations. 
Next slide. So what does this look like in practice? Here's a vaccination safety claim. We've got the insinuation that death, deaths reported in VAERS were caused by a COVID-19 vaccination. Here's an example. Numbers reflect latest data from CDC's Vaccine Averse Event Reporting System. Of the 929 reported deaths, about a third occurred within 48 hours. The inference is that one caused the other. It's an insinuation, not a direct claim. Here's the fact check. What's the background knowledge that you need across this? What VAERS actually does, what VAERS actually reports. So every deception that uses VAERS as the backdrop needs to have in place in our public on the far end of the science defense shield, the knowledge that says these are just reports, they haven't been verified. But the verification process is a sign that science is going to look at it carefully and as a result, determine whether there is a problem or not. Next slide. So how can we integrate this into a protective health knowledge fact checking model? Next slide. We can synthesize what science knows in each category at that time. A key point that we need to reiterate is that science is constantly studying and updating and knowledge is aggregating. And as a result, you will have changes in what is known. So we don't wanna say what science knows, it's what science knows at the time. Digesting that knowledge into verbal and visual gists. A gist is the bottom line, it's the takeaway. It's not all the details and gists increase memorability. And we want to introduce vocabulary needed to understand the relevant science. Journalists are really good at all three of these things. And here is the place in which journalists come together with the public health community in order to increase public understanding in the face of challenges on factual grounds to the knowable about public health. Next slide. So let's go back to the categories. Each of us has written this, and so I don't need to summarize, I'm just going to drop into boxes. What it is we know about origins, about transmission, about existence, about diagnosis and testing, about, next slide, prevention, preventatives and treatment, and vaccination. This is the more detailed science, and we write it into our fact checks. But the point that I want to make, next slide, is that we want to communicate what science knows in terms of gists. We wanna put the detail in well-written and well-analyzed and compelling to our audiences, understandable and compelling, but we wanna reduce it to a bottom line as well so they have a takeaway. People don't remember the detail, they remember the gist. And this concept developed by Valerie Reyna, very important social scientific concept, if infused through fact-checking, will increase the likelihood that when you walk away from a fact-check, you, on a science area about public health, you not only know, well, that was wrong, but you have a gist that helps you carry the knowledge away so that you can apply it and recall the detail and recall the fact checking when you need it in some unanticipated moment faced perhaps with that deception already checked or a new one that falls into that domain. So for example, getting COVID is much riskier than getting the vaccine is a gist. The risks of taking hydroxychloroquine for COVID outweigh the benefits is a gist. Masks help reduce the spread of the virus is a gist. They help. They don't completely block. They are not 100% effective. And once you say masks help, then the question becomes, well, do some masks do it better than others? Yes. How do they help? Now we can start explaining. So Defining back into gist should be one of our responsibilities as fact checkers, not simply deploying the knowledge, but deploying it in gist form. Next. Also, there are visual gists. So when we've got the verbal gist, we can also use visuals in order to reinforce. So how contagious is COVID? Now, what's the gist here? It's more contagious than the common flu, but less so than measles. Here's your visual that creates the iconic memory representation that increases the likelihood that we anchor the gist visually. Next slide. Same thing. Seeing is more powerful than telling. This says masks help. You see that mask isn't 100% effective there. That visual matters. We have a propositional print bias in our fact checking, apart from our broadcast colleagues. 
we should remember that we should be showing as well as telling. Next. And here, of course, is an iconic representation of the need to socially distance, which should be always called physical distancing, not social distancing, because we don't want to socially distance. It's social contact that was keeping us healthy through the pandemic. Next. So now let's go and see about key vocabulary, because the other thing we can give the public is the language it needs if it's going to discuss in the domain. And I'm just putting a number of things up on screen. And I want to show you that if you understand that something is respiratory and droplet borne and aerosolized, and there's asymptomatic transmission, you can, you can convey the virus when you don't look or seem sick to somebody else, then prevention follows from that understanding of transmission. If those things on the left are true, then you want to mask, you want to physically distance, you want to use proper hand hygiene, et cetera, and you want to have good ventilation. Why? Because that's how you'd prevent the transmission. And now we're starting to schematize the knowledge. We're starting to show people the relationships among the kinds of knowledge that we have. And understanding that that is then reducible to gists becomes a way of incorporating the broader scientific context around it. Next. And the process, by the way, saying that getting the vaccine has substantially less risk and getting COVID is an important gist. And the language there is it's safer than getting the disease. The va vaccine is far, 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 far safer than getting the disease. We don't want categorical statements that people can misinterpret and use to indict and use to say you can't trust the science. So how do we do this in the fact checking that we do right now? We're in a digital print form. We can incorporate at the beginning of our fact checks. Here's the fact check, the headline is, Video uses bogus claims to stoke race-based fears of COVID-19 vaccine. Let's open up our little box. And here we have, we're digesting the science. No vaccine or medical product is 100% safe. Why are we saying that? We're concerned that when people hear safe, they'll hear categorically 100%, et cetera. You see the basic knowledge. Next slide. This is a viral clip. This is the one we're going to be debunking. Makes bogus claims about COVID-19 vaccines and falsely accuses the government of pure racism for pushing this heavily on blacks and browns. Public health experts have recommended prioritizing these communities for vaccines because they have suffered higher rates of infection. Here's the preemptive response. Before we've done the actual fact We are check. black American members of the National Academy of Medicine. The premier health science organization in our nation. We are scientists, physicians, healthcare professionals, and public health experts. We are also sisters, mothers, wives, and daughters. We are brothers, fathers, husbands, and sons. Trust in government does not come easily for our community. Too often our health has been ignored and even abused. As health professionals, we understand the science. As members of the Black community, we understand your distrust. But COVID-19 is very serious and it has a devastating impact on our community. We have reviewed the research. And we are confident the research was done correctly. We support the COVID-19 vaccine, and we encourage you to get vaccinated. Do it for our community. Do it because we should not tolerate one more preventable death. We often make statements about what science knows and speak about consensus in the scientific community. We often quote experts in the community to tell us what science knows. Here's an example of the individuals, 100% of them in the National Academy of Medicine, the most prestigious medical association in the United States, who have all signed on to a statement certifying that they believe that the vaccine is safe and effective, and they're telling you that they take the vaccine. Now, whether one wants to put this in one's fact check is a question of whether one wants to move toward this kind of discourse. And I realize for some, they may not want to move to this kind of discourse. They may want to stay with the, the more traditional forms of consensus statement studies. I would argue that these individuals who have done the science are equivalent to making a print statement that says there's a statement from the National Academy of Science and Engineering, sorry, National Academy of Medicine, that says that the vaccine is safe and effective. For practical purpose, it is visualized it and dramatized it. I'm comfortable with this. Next slide. We also 
are putting the protective knowledge inside the structure by synthesizing what science knows. Next. So let's take a look at, here we have video misrepresents Fauci's comments on COVID-19 vaccine. That's our headline. A highly viewed Facebook video distorts a CNN interview with Dr. Anthony Fauci to falsely suggest that a COVID-19 vaccine authorized in the US doesn't protect you from COVID. The vaccine does protect against COVID, which is the disease caused by the coronavirus. Fauci was simply cautioning, it may not prevent someone from contracting the virus. Here's the video that is putting the preemptive knowledge in place. Science updates as it learns more. Earth was one thought to be flat. The body was one thought to be governed by four humors. In the case of a new virus, new insights produce changed recommendations. In March 2020, Dr. Anthony Fauci told 60 Minutes. The masks are important for someone who's infected to prevent them from infecting someone else. Right now in the United States, people should not be walking around with masks. But on April 3rd, the CDC said, CDC recommends wearing cloth face coverings in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. And CDC also advises the use of simple cloth face coverings to slow the spread of the virus and help people who may have the virus and do not know it from transmitting it to others. The guidance changed because scientists were learning that those experiencing no symptoms could still transmit the coronavirus. By April, scientists were more confident that a person who was showing no symptoms could be infected and spread the virus to others. What science knew was updated with the accumulating evidence about transmission from people without symptoms. So when someone in your social circle says that Dr. Fauci should not be trusted because he once said people should not be walking around with masks, remind them of this. That recommendation referred to those who weren't sick. And it was made at a time when the scientific evidence on transmission from people without symptoms was still accumulating. For more information on masks and COVID-19, visit SciCheck, a project of factcheck.org. So instead of simply correcting the Fauci deception, deception about uh, Dr. Fauci, by saying, no, look, here's what he said in that moment. We are trying to put in place a foundational piece of knowledge. What science knows changes across time and remind people with the video that Dr. Fauci said now in that statement, now, what science knows now. If people understand that and someone says with any of those deceptions that say, scientists change, CDC change, those, all those categories of deception can be preempted with one statement. That is, science regularly updates. Next. So what is the evidence that this will work? Let me now become highly telegraphic and turn into my more traditional academic mode. We know that, and this is from earlier in the presentation, organizing in categories increases the likelihood that you've got recall. Next slide. We know that prior exposure familiarizes. We know that to the extent that you get information recurrently, you're more likely to think it's accurate. Why is it important that we continue to put the basic knowledge in? Because familiarity increases perceived accuracy. And that familiarity with increased accuracy also, because we've got it in categories, is going to retain, is going to increase its retention. Next slide. We also know that negating is not effective. We need to displace. This is a model that says, here's the accurate context with which we can use not only to displace the bad, but preempt it so that unanticipated deceptions can be counteracted with it. Next. We also know that when experiments have offered people detailed information up front, and this is information about vaccination, it has been preemptively effective. This is very traditionally the kind of thing that we would see at the back end of our fact checks rather than at the front end of our fact checks. Relevant knowledge reduces susceptibility to conspiracy theories. Next. We also know that gists work and a point that I've made earlier, and here's a sample of Dr. Reyna's work. They increase the likelihood that messages are remembered. Next slide. So I've offered you five basic reasons why a preemptive, proactive, protective knowledge-based model 
could increase the power of our fact checking and the likelihood that will arm the people on the back end of our defense shield, the people in their daily lives talking with each other to better protect those in their families and their networks from deception. Next slide. Why does it matter? First slide. Because what we know from our research and others is accepting misinformation predicts reduced will willing willingness to vaccinate. And we need to get higher levels of vaccination in order to create not herd immunity, but community immunity. Because communities need to hit that threshold and communities are localized, not nationalized. My local supermarket, my child's daycare center, our localized communities, the pediatric office my child goes to, those all have to have the level of immunity needed to minimize spread. It doesn't matter if the nation has it. If my community doesn't, I'm not protected. That's why we should say community immunity and not herd immunity. But acceptance of misinformation predicts reduced willingness to vaccinate. And we need to get our populations vaccinated to stop COVID. Next, we also know the conspiracy beliefs prospectively predict resistance to preventive action and vaccination. Next slide. And as a result, belief in vaccination misinformation is associated with reluctance to vaccinate. Next. So here's the model on the bottom line. Integrate a thematic organizational structure into fact checking, integrate protective health knowledge into fact checking. And I think the academic research suggests we're going to better arm individuals who are our audience to help in the process of protecting people they care about from consequential misinformation. I'd be happy to take your comments or your questions. This research is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the views expressed here do not re necessarily reflect the views of the foundation. We're very grateful for their support. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, it was a great presentation and I know our audience will have a couple of questions, but I already have a few. So before I just like you know, dive into those, I strongly encourage uh, everyone in the, you know, the uh, session to just you know share their questions using either the Q&A uh, feature or the chat uh, box. We will be monitoring those. So um, uh, on your op-ed at pointer.org and during this you know presentation as well, you um, basically referring to the years building up to 2003, the uh, setup of the factcheck.org, and um, basically pointed to the presidential campaign advertisement as the root cause of the, you know, the uh, establishment of professional fact-checking in the United States. Uh, and your offer to news publishers such as NPR, the Washington Post at that time was very simple in your own words, find the problem with the claim and offer a correction. Mm -hmm. um, and we are just talking about a whole new approach to uh, tackling misinformation at a larger scale. Uh, and I will be just asking um, probably just like two questions, which I believe will be related uh, to ask you a little bit, a little bit uh, on that as well. So um, I think it's fair to say that much has been achieved since 2003 in the field of fact-checking, uh, especially around, you know, finding the problematic claim and you know, asking for a correction and holding the powerful accountable in that sense. Um, and we have been also able to, you know, make some accomplishments in the sense that we are now more able to address the need for, you know, scalability in our fact checking and go beyond traditional methods to communicate with our audiences. A uh, number of fact checking organizations in the last couple of years have uh, conducted uh, several research to find better ways to communicate fact checks with uh, audiences, uh, with different and practically suspicious audiences as well. Um, and during your presentation, you um, have put a strong emphasis on uh, the protective and preemptive uh, model for fact checking. Um, and just to wrap up, during your presentation, um, you also laid out that structure about the defense shield and you um, identified knowledge, uh, understanding and norms as the basis of that shield uh, of defense, particularly around scientific issues. Um, I'm going to ask two questions after this, you know, long commentary, but I'll hopefully like more prep work for my questions. Um, we're also seeing like fact checking has become like a household name and non-fact checkers as well are using the concept of fact checking to, um, you know, leverage legitimacy on their claims, on their bogus claims, on their you know, conspiracy theories. So my question will be how fact checkers should counter um, beliefs and group identity and those who are weaponizing fact checking 
uh, to spread misinformation uh, and basically, you know, increase hesitancy against vaccines, um, cast shadow on the effectiveness of, you know, um, physical distancing, uh, mask, uh, face coverings. Uh, what would be the way that fact checkers need to um, go through to counter those activities as well, uh, since we are now experiencing um, the first infodemic of the 21st century? Uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a larger question about how do we deal with disinformation pervasive across society. But my first response is fact checkers need to do their job and do their job well in ways that do not increase their susceptibility to any kind of distortion about them or about what they do. There's very important research uh, developed by any number of scholars, uh, David Rand at MIT among them, uh, that focus on the ways in which an, a, the, a, a nudging toward accuracy and accuracy motivation increases the likelihood that people will process the information and process it well and process it apart from their partisan selves. We should not be giving any cues that we are in a partisan fight. We should be dealing with what is knowable against what is being claimed in a way that ensures that we are treating right, left, and center in exactly the same way and that we have the same kind of fidelity to what is knowable and that we are highly disclosive of what it is we know and how we know. Our links to primary sources and our explanations of why we trust them are very important in a world in which you can no longer assume the credibility of some of the sources that we rely on or at least assume that it will be granted by your audiences. So making sure that we are clear about how we know what we know and why we trust those we trust about the knowledge that we have means that we need to be turning to multiple sources of evidence that converge on the same claim and not relying on single sources. That we need to ensure that we are inviting the audience to see itself as in search of what is accurate as opposed to reinforcing partisan identity. We did this in an experiment in which a headline suggested that because Arctic sea ice had recovered in one year, the problem was solved and showed that if you can show people the range of the satellite data in an iterative trend line that shows the Arctic sea ice change across time, people would overcome the false belief that just that little recovery, well, actually substantial recovery, but within a downward trend per, was projecting that we were gonna have, we have solved the problem. We don't need to be concerned about climate change. The, the importance of that experiment is the move that we're making is a fundamentally a fact-checking move. It was saying to the audience, and this is my last point in answer to your question, we need to trust our audience with being able to work through data on its own wherever possible. In that case, what drew people back to seeing that this trend was downward on Arctic sea ice, that that so-called recovery was a blip within a downward trend, was that they got to ask themselves questions about the trend line. And they couldn't find a point in the trend line prompted by our questions that were anything earlier in the past six years was lower than anything in the last six years, including the year that had the large recovery. Well, what does that say? If you're in your partisan self, you might process it through ideology, but when you're asked what is there and you trust the data, this is NASA data, a full range of NASA data, there only was satellite data 79 through that date, people would engage in that process and come to correct inferences. We need to find good ways to prompt people to be accuracy motivated as they look at our material and to see us as people who share that concern and properly qualify our claims, are careful about our positioning of our voice so that it's clear that we aren't actually partisans in this, in this exchange. We are just trying to find out what is the best knowable evidence. Great, thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, so we have three questions right now and I will be surfacing the first one coming from a Q&A function. And I hope uh, this uh, question has been uh, surfaced on our session as well, but I'm just gonna read it through. Um, so Kathleen, this is from NG from Poltafag and it's gonna be much more like a practical question from a fact checker's perspective. Um, so she, uh, she says, you know, she loves the framework and it makes a lot of sense. But on the other hand, it is in her own words, in, in intimidating in a way because it suggests that fact checkers need to redesign their websites and amp up their visual resources. Uh, and that can be challenging because of both of causes inertia. Um, and she's asking if you would like to share your thoughts on that. Yeah, the, we're going to be putting out a white paper um, the, on this in, in about two, two and a half weeks, which has some detail. And we do recognize that it's easiest to put your stuff up in a chronological order. It's simply the programming involved. It's easier to do it that way. The, 
the, the question becomes when you get into a COVID situation where we've been now fact checking COVID for more than a year as a fact checking community, uh, we're in a, an unusual situation because we have the capacity to build out a structure once and hold that structure. So yes, there is one, there's a cost to doing it for this one period of time. But if we're correct that this is a model for dealing with infectious disease, then we could have used this with Zika, which we were fact checking a number of years ago. We could use this with Ebola because these are the same categories science goes through to ask about infectious diseases. And so if we have that icon structure programmed and there is some cost in getting that programmed and ready to deploy, first, we can continue to deploy it now, particularly in the vaccination category, which is the category of greatest concern right now and the highest number of deceptions about, about um, vaccination are the ones that are percolating right now. But it means that we are potentially going forward already ready so that the next time we get an infectious disease, and notice in the last few years, we've had Zika, Ebola, we've had MERS, we've had SARS, and now we've had SARS-CoV-2. If we say part of our responsibility is to public health fact checking, it's a one-time expense, not an ongoing expense. And I, I would urge the fact checkers who believe that this model will work to think about asking those who support their sites, including the people who send small donations in because they believe in this kind of fact checking, to say, would you like to help us do this? And then we're going to keep deploying that whenever we get an infectious disease. Thank you so much. Um, so we have two, actually three more questions, and I'm going to try my best to uh, see if I can you know, merge at least the two of them. So the question uh, is from Sabine uh, Bergzina, and she's asking actually how to deal with the backfire effect, you know, the, the assumption that fact checking can have a backfire effect which in fact has been, you know, itself been debunked by, you know, researchers and studies uh, in the last couple of years, but there's a still, you know, uh, understanding within the industry that fact-checking can backfire, especially when it is consumed by, you know, partisan groups and, you know, uh, individuals. So um, she's also asking the question whether, you know, or how fact-checkers should also tackle you know, ridiculous misinformation, you know, disinformation about like fact checkers are particularly, you know, practically, you know, um, working for the agenda of like, you know, George Soros or like the governments or even, the, you know, foreign agents. So they are undermined and they're, you know, harassed by, you know, people, uh, their critics. Uh, how fact checkers should deal with those, you know, circumstances when they are working with, you know, uh, for information that is very crucial for our lives and, you know, basically, you know, uh, health uh, safeness. No, it if you simply negate, if you simply say that's not true, you're not helpful because you're running the risk that the memory trace of the underlying claim is being reinforced and then negated with not, and it doesn't displace the memory trace. You run some risk that reinforces the memory trace. Long form fact checking doesn't do that. Good fact checking headlines don't do that. And this preemptive model does not do that. The preponderance of evidence right now suggests that longer form fact checking and fact checking in shorter forms done conceptually and well does produce effects. It doesn't produce effects for all. No one ever suggested it would. Once someone believes something, they've anchored the attitude, they've incorporated the information into that attitude structure, it's very difficult to get that removed. But as I've shown, it's the reason I started the presentation, those people who aren't sure are not there. They're in a space in which if this is done well, and if what doesn't cue them into partisan space where identity protection comes to play, one ought to be able to increase knowledge. I also started with those slides to say, look at how successful the public health community and the fact checkers have actually been about COVID. Look at all those lines in which I was showing you green. That means accurate, accurate, accurate. Mm -hmm. those, that was a topic that the public knew nothing about a year ago, and now is accurately answering all of those questions. So there's a tendency to say, oh no, this is hopeless. We haven't persuaded everyone that this is actually factually you know, true given the knowledge that we have at this moment. That's the wrong way to frame the question. Look at what's been accomplished. Look at those people who are open to what we are doing. Those who aren't already anchored, bless them. I hope that they get exposed. The likelihood of going to affect them is minimal. It's not my goal to affect them. The goal is to minimize the likelihood that those who are susceptible to being there move into that space because we didn't get the good knowledge out. The advantage we have in infectious disease is everyone is potentially affected by the topic. Salience increases attention. 
People want to do what's right and best for themselves and their families. The question is, can we communicate with the best available evidence what we know about what that is and the factual grounding of it, recognizing that knowledge may update and we may as a result learn more and some of that may change across time. As to your first question, at right now the fact checking community is under active assault um, where people are being sued. You have a legislative proposal in Michigan that is going after the International Fact Checking Network and appears to suggest a high need for civics education because it, people do not appear to understand that we do have a first amendment. In that environment, I think the, the danger is that we get distracted by it and we engage in it in a way that contaminates what we are actually doing. This movement has a substantial audience. If it deploys the knowledge that is available well and does its job honorably, and when it makes mistakes, corrects, it is going to continue to have an impact. I worry about everybody getting into what looks like a partisan fight and then everything that is done over in journalism space looks as if it now has been inflected with partisanship. That potentially would do more damage than, it, than counter, counteracting those other kinds of moves would, would, gain, would gain for the community. I think someone else should be fighting that fight. The fact-checking community ought to be doing its job. And there are people standing up ready to take on um, that fight on behalf of the community that, rather than the community itself. Right, I mean, it, it was a great you know, way to just conceptualize our model that fact-checking works and it can save lives and your you know, research and you know, uh, the presentation was a great test, testament to that. Um, and again, we are going through interesting times, as you said, I mean, fact checking has been under attack for a while. And it looks like here in the United States, even in the United States, of the country of the First Amendment, uh, lawmakers, you know, find it, you know, okay to try to find fact checkers just for being their job. Um, and there are also, I, by the way, is there, there are consistent efforts to harass fact checkers. True. True. And All around the, the world. Yeah. The, or the organizations that, that operate the, the fact checking structures need to ensure that they have protected their journalists from harassment. And if that means that, you know, when you make your phone calls to talk to sources, you've cloaked your phone number so that they can't post it online so that people who would like to hurt you uh, or harass you can find you, that means that we make sure we've got the capacity to cloak the phone numbers that people are calling from in order to interview potential sources to document information. Exactly. I mean, it's you know, it's a time for you know unusual measures, and I guess you know we all need to be more careful about that as well. So, um, just running out of our time, I see one more question, uh, and it's again from like a more a technical you know point of view, but I think it will make a lot of sense to all of us who are very interested in like you know finding better ways to communicate our fact check. So, um, Shachi Staria is asking, you know, how do we ensure that the technical terminologies that the experts use and we you know, uh, advise them for our fact checks are not lost as jargon when we write it, them for the readers. What, what is so important about journalists doing this job is journalists talent for understanding what the public hears as opposed to what the scientists are trying to say and think the public hears. Journalists are natural translators. And so there, there's a headline that I love. It, it, was, it was a CBS News headline on, online um, the CBS News said that, that the, 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 he saw the confusion between the terms eradicate and eliminate about measles, and it basically put the problematic term in quotation marks to suggest that even though the CDC was using one word, measles still existed, we still needed measles vaccines. And with that, that impulse on the part of the reporter to say, the public isn't hearing you, CDC, they're not hearing an eradicate eliminate distinction the way you're using it and to clarify that for the public was what journalists do every day they find the language that the public will understand without violating in the translation process the underlying science and one of the things the scientific community needs to do is to be careful about deploying language into what amounts to public space that can be misinterpreted for example if you talk about lipid nanoparticles in an environment in which conspiracy theories are saying that there are microchips and nano chips inside vaccines someone is going to find the lipo nanoparticle language and is going to be using it and so luciferase is another someone's going to see that and is going to say oh that's lucifer and as a result you have the devil involved in some kind of beast marking inside a vaccination process so to the extent that journalists in the fact-checking community see that language in science, they need to mark it off and explain it with great clarity before it can be misconstrued 
into forms of deception that may be accepted innocently by individuals who now think somehow science has legitimized what in fact is a distorted claim. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, so we are just two minutes short of our time, but I'd like to, um, first of all, um, thank you so much for joining in today uh, and doing this presentation with us. And as promised, uh, we will be sharing the, the paper that we were talking about during your presentation uh, later today when it's gonna be published. So all of the attendees of this session will get an email with that, you know, uh, with a link to that study. And the survey, uh, we will, we'll send you the survey too, thanks to your wonderful staff. Wonderful. So our attendees will be having a very fortunate day to have, you know, to be able to have access to those, you know, uh, findings. So, um, and, you know, the session will be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel later today. So um, feel free to share with your colleagues, with your teams. I know that we are uh, live streaming to participants all around the world. So uh, feel free to just like spread the word around. So I'm just gonna, you know, um, try to wrap up with like one final question. Um, you've talked about um, some, you know, models, uh, a model uh, that you think should be at the core of fact checkers for in communicating, you know, our fact checks uh, with the public, uh, with the public, and having basically at the middle of um, this infodemic, um, I was wondering, uh, what do you think is going to be the the biggest challenge or the you know largest you know uh, blind spot um, in the second half of 2021 and in 2022 uh, for fact checkers in uh, communicating health related misinformation. The the fact checking movement in the United States started out focusing on politics, not on health. We need to increase our capacity to to track good science, um, and that may, that's often complicated science about matters that directly intersect the public. So we've developed a small cadre of science journalists now within factcheck.org so that when we get science challenges, challenges to what is known about science, we are able to draw on their science background in order to write the fact checks. Uh, I think that the challenge for the fact checking community at a time which journalism is under real stress is building up from its COVID capacity an ongoing public health capacity so that particularly the next time we hit an infectious disease, um, we, are, we are on the ground as fast as we can be with the best preventive knowledge. I see the fact-checking movement as very important in politics. Now, I don't want to disregard its importance, but its importance in public health is extraordinarily great. And we don't yet have the developed capacity across the global fact-checking network. Although we've developed a great deal of it during COVID, my fear is we're going to get past COVID and lose it instead of get past COVID and institutionalize it and build it. And those who care about this marrying of the public health model and the fact checking model, which is what this is trying to do, ought to try to find ways to find the funding to ensure that that capacity is deepened inside fact checking across the globe. Because just as we're protecting ourselves from the virus that is the physical virus in those moments, we also need to protect ourselves from the viral deception. To some extent, they are intertwined. To some extent, they're equally pernicious. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, I appreciate the time and I thank you on behalf of the um, International Fact Checking Network and all of our attendees. Uh, it was great to have you today here um, and looking forward to seeing you again, hopefully in person sometime soon. And please steal our icons if you'd like them, steal our structures. <laughs> We'd love to have anybody use them or make them better and we would adopt the better. Right, that's a great call for action. The community will be, you know, more than happy to reach out and, you know, uh, see how we can move this forward. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And You're everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Bye bye.